Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. Sparkfall, your one-stop walk-in closet for creative inspiration. I'm Laura Cami, And I'm Susan Blackwell. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. You may be asking yourself, what exactly is a spark file? Where do I get one? What do I file in it? These are good. <laughs> Why do you sound like Gomer Pyle? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. These are good <laughs> questions, and we have got answers. We do. A spark file is a place where you consistently collect all of your inspirations and fascinations. Here's the deal. We are makers, and we are always making all kinds of things. And if you're like us and making stuff all the time or want to be making stuff all the time, you know the wellspring of inspiration can run a little dry. So we're on the lookout for fresh ideas, images, and inspiration that spark our creativity and pique our curiosity, things that inspire us to get up off of our asses and make things like this podcast. Or an idea that induces sweaty palms, nausea, and potentially crapping your pants. Wow. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or... A lifetime full of creativity built to give love and to get love. Every episode, we're going to reach into the spark file and exchange some sparks. And if you're not careful, you might appreciate the sparks in your own backyard. So without further ado, let's open up the the spark spark file. That's how you say it now. That's how the kids are saying it now. Yes. Um, I just have... I've, I've, I've gone around the bend. I've gone loopy loop. I love when you go around the bend. I want to see what's back there. This happened when the theme song came up, and I was like, so just full disclosure, counselors, we, this is sort of the culmination of the Spark File New Year 2020 Creativity Workshop and Live Podcast. <laughs> Which this, has been a weekend. This is the live podcast That's portion right. of the proceedings. And, and so <laughs> the audience is, you know, singing along with the theme song. And I'm like, this is the best sounding. This has, like, there's harmonies. And I was like, what's Aww. happening? And then I looked over and I was like, oh, half of Broadway <laughs> is sitting in the audience. And I was like, it's because we brought in the ringers and the professionals. If you could That's be why. here for every episode, that would be great. That would. Um, it's been a hell of a weekend. It's been amazing. It's been a joy ride. Yeah. Me. Yeah. And I, I think awesome. it bears mentioning that we are recording this in front of a live audience at Mark Fisher Fitness that in right. the heart of Midtown Manhattan. And this space, we're so thankful to be in this space because mm. it has just, it is sort of like, it's absolutely chock-a-block with its own sparks and creativity and positivity. It is, and it's also full of that loving and supportive vibe 100%. That, we, that we all need. Yeah. 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 It's pretty yeah. good. It's pretty good. Yeah. Do we have anything else we want to say before, is there a kitty cat in here? <laughs> um, Anthony left his cat here. So. <laughs> 
don't, I don't know what happened. It rubbed off on me. Um, real quick, I just want to check levels real quick. Okay, check those levels. This is what happens when you engineer your own podcast. <laughs> That's better. How are the levels? Don't know. We'll find out when we get home. <laughs> Great. Suze, so I think we've reached that the part in the program where we each reach into our spark vials and share a spark. Uh, Is that I correct? I would love nothing more. And I think you're going first. I am. And that means I'm going to sit back. Sit I'm going to relax. Listen. I'm going to drink this entire <laughs> how many ounces? 32 ounces of gin. And you <laughs> let her rip. Okay. All right. So I reached into my spark file this week. Um, Suze, I don't know if you know uh, Jenny Slate, the comedian. I has... love Jenny Slate. I do too. I do too. She has a book out that's called, I hope I'm getting this right, Little Weirds. Little Weirds. I mean, Done. I don't want to jump your spark, but when I saw the title of that book, I was just like, <laughs> why didn't I think of Little Weirds? For those of you who know the term jumping the shark, for us, it's jumping the spark. I'm not going to jump your spark, I don't but get ahead let of you. me say it before you do. Just kidding. That's not my spark. But I love Little Weirds. I love that. You're like, this spark has it. nothing to do with Jenny Slate. But it does, though. But she also has a new Netflix stand up special called Stage Fright. Yes. And the tagline for that show is, fear is a funny thing. Huh. I love that. I went around saying it for like 24 hours. I was like, fear is a funny thing. It is. It is. I think it's the most genius tagline for a comedy special that is called Stage Fright. Um, it's layered but I hear it's also you, I hear you knocking I hear you saying thing. it and I'm like it, it uh, I get hey. there because to me sometimes it's just just pant crap I'm hearing this yeah and I want to hear <laughs> no I'm kidding <laughs> devil wears Prada okay sorry <laughs> for those of you listening you don't get the visual <laughs> uh, I was just silent yes yeah. but anyway I think fear is a funny thing I also think it's a tragic thing and a complicated thing. Or if you subscribe to Elizabeth Gilbert's thinking, it's a boring thing. Hmm. According to Liz Gilbert, she says, I know for a fact that my fear is the most boring thing about me. This is especially true when it comes, from, when it comes to living a life of creativity. Fear is boring because fear only ever has one thing to say to us, and that thing is stop. So when I first read that Liz Gilbert thought fear was boring, I thought she was going to say that it was boring because we all have it and no yeah. fear is particularly unique. It's rather yeah. universal, yeah. which is a good thing. I think knowing that when you experience fear, you're not alone. Everyone has it. Um, I also think of thinking of fear as boring sort of minimizes it and acknowledges that it's there, but it doesn't give it quite doesn't so much energize power, it so much, right? Yep. Like it's not the loudest voice in the room. Mm -hmm. That part I like. But I don't quite agree with her 100%. Like, yes, I agree the sole Ooh, purpose of fear. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. That's right. Liz is wrong. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you why. Will never listen to this podcast. <laughs> I think we're safe. I think we're safe. But yeah, I don't agree with her 100%. I do agree that the sole purpose of fear is to get you to stop. But I don't really think that she's giving fear the credit that it's due. I think fear is crafty. Yes. I think fear is very creative in the ways that it will try to get you to yeah. stop. That is why I think fear is a funny thing. Because if you step back and look at the incredibly creative ways that fear is trying to work its magic on you, how hard it's tap dancing to get you worked up or distracted or tangled up in it, like I think that if you could step back and look at it, sometimes you might be able to laugh at it and its ridiculousness. Take me there, Cammie. Yeah. Oh, Take well, me there. I, hey, sit back. <laughs> We're going on a ride. Drink your gin. So we went to story gathering last year um, in, in Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. Yep. And there was a speaker there who we weren't able to see, or at least I wasn't. I don't think you did. Who was it? Mira Lee Patel. And I couldn't see her segment because we had conflicting schedules, but I met her briefly. And I learned that the title of her book is My Friend Fear. Mm. And I was like, well, I'm done. I mean, I'm so in. Count me on board. I need a copy of that book. I'm totally with you. How can I support? I mean, 
you know those those moments when like something rings so true yeah. for you like yeah. sometimes it feels so simple almost like how did I not think of that before yeah. but I didn't Mira did um but it just felt so right to me I've always loved the idea of making friends with fear yes wait Mira sorry mm -hmm. Mira was at that dinner with us she was. and the book that she made is it sort of like it's illustrations it is. and yes it is yeah okay I'm it looking. is totally okay it's beautiful I'm going to talk about that um jump in my spar I'm going to jump in my spar I'm kidding um so I've always loved the idea of making friends with fear I think that at one time in my life it was a pretty radical notion like if you had said it to me maybe 20 years ago I would have thought like there's no way that fear and I are going to be friends. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but over time, I think that once I learned that concept of what we resist persists, and then I learned that the objective is not to avoid or eradicate fear. If we embrace it, if we accept it, we can move forward with it by our side, but we're moving forward nonetheless. I just want to acknowledge that as you're speaking, just as you're speaking the words, yeah. it gives me a visceral feeling in my body. Like I start to get afraid <sighs> and it starts to make me, if I'm honest, you're like, have to fear is not going to be my BFF. It's, I, it does, have I don't BFFs. know, just talking about it, like I start to feel I start to twist a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Let's twist together. So writer James Clear said, Fear isn't something that must be avoided. It's not an indicator that you're doing things wrong. Fear is simply a cost that all artists have to pay on the way to doing meaningful work. Mm. Word. So there's no scenario where you're going to have a fulfilling creative life and not feel fear, period. I think that, I mean, that's my opinion, but if you're going to do meaningful work, and by that I mean work that means something to you, it's always going to be by your side yeah you know and the sooner that you can befriend fear the sooner you can reap the benefits of it rather than suffer the repercussions of it mm. so this is the basic premise of mira lee patel's book my friend fear which is officially the topic of my spark today <gasps> we are at the spark now that's my topic okay great so um listen i might give you like a few spoilers but i still think you should get the book okay um one because i'm not going to tell you everything but she's also a self-taught visual artist so the book is as you mentioned like beautifully illustrated yeah, yeah. uh her paintings and her drawings so it's it's worth getting the book uh regardless of our conversation today also this is certainly not going to be the end all be all conversation about fear i think that fear will weave its way through our conversations probably as it does uh in many episodes but i'd like to take you know using the framework of her book i'd like to talk about it today so when we talk to uh lynn manuel when we talk to sarah borellis fear is often a topic lynn had said that the pressure and the fear do not dissipate as you achieve success and accolades. In fact, they increase. Oh, God. So he said, you just learn to deal with it more effectively and you keep moving forward. Yeah. Sarah Bareilles talked about how often she feels fear and she pushes through it constantly oh. in order to try new things. Side spark, because Side I don't know that we've talked about this expressly on mic on the podcast. And if we have, please enjoy it again. After we were done recording mm. the interview with Sarah Bareilles in mm. her living room, Sarah mm -hmm. was like, how, how, this is great. How are you guys doing? Are you excited for the launch of your podcast? It was right before we launched. And I just remember taking her by the shoulders and looking her in the eye and just saying, Sarah, I am losing sleep at night. I am up and twisting with anxiety that people are going to come for us and they're going to say we're doing it wrong. We were talking about it. Hi, and Laura Coward. Hi, I've Laura said Coward. your name on a podcast. Um, what did Sarah that, say to that? That people are going to come for us. Yeah. I'm so, I had was very present to my fear that people were going to come for us. Yep. For what? Fill in the blank. I didn't Could know. Could be anything. And sweet, sweet, wise, Sarah Bareilles looked me in the eye and said, they're going to come for you. And I was like, 
Huh? That's your response? That was the wrong answer, Sarah. Don't say it. Thanks, Sarah Barillas. But she was like, they're going to. Like, if you make something that has any sort of visibility, they are going to come for you. And and you, yeah. you can't give a shit. Or you have to have ways of dealing coping. and coping with that. That's right. And I was like... It's like learning that the Easter Bunny is. It was. It was really something. Sorry. Spoiler. Side spark concluded. The Easter Bunny isn't real. Oh, spoiler! So, sorry if we ruined that for you. But <laughs> we need to put a content well, warning at the top of this for <laughs> young listeners. Anyway, so let's just start with a basic understanding. And I know you know this, but I just want to have a collective understanding. What is fear? If you're Susan Blackwell. Fear might be defined by the need to shit your pants. It's the truth. If you're Camion, yeah. it might be defined by a daily cry, like the character in Broadcast News. <laughs> this is how this lives for us. But truly, <laughs> fear is defined as a feeling induced by perceived danger or threat, which causes a change in metabolic and organ functions, and ultimately a change in behavior, such as fleeing, hiding, or freezing from perceived traumatic event. So I'm interested in looking at that definition again. Let's dissect it. Okay. It's really three pieces. Fear is defined as one, a feeling induced by perceived danger or threat. Mm -hmm. Two, which causes a change in metabolic and organ functions. And three, ultimately a change in behavior such as fleeing, hiding, or freezing from perceived traumatic events. This is great. Right? Yeah. First, I, I can't help but noticing the use of the word perceived on several occasions. So let's, you know, let's just acknowledge that perceived threats. But piece by piece, number one, a feeling induced by perceived danger or threat. Everyone seems to agree that fear is a primitive emotion handed down through evolution designed to keep us safe from, you know, saber toothed tigers and whatnot. And we're meant to sense a possible threat have our brain translate that as a warning and get everything moving so that we can escape to safety. But as humans evolved, our fear evolved as well. So rather than a simple fight or flight response, we now have a more complicated emotion that has spawned secondary emotions like guilt, despair, and shame. And these feelings, these lovely feelings linger and can slowly take root inside of our bodies. Yeah. Yay, evolution. <laughs> Yeah. Yay. So, yay. <laughs> Part two of the definition, which causes a change in metabolic and organ functions. And yes, Anthony, like, just yeah. tore that up. But fear begins in the mind. It quickly starts sending orders to change things physically. The nervous system sends out the warning message. The adrenaline surges through the brain first. This will create the desire to make quick, impulsive, split-second decisions. Mm. Then it moves through your limbs, your arms and legs, preparing you to run, to literally escape the danger. To make that possible, your heart pumps blood harder and faster, which makes your breathing more shallow. You might be sweating, your blood sugar is spiking, the muscles may be inflating, which pushes each hair follicle on end, perhaps causing goosebumps. Visceral. So that's what's happening with those goosebumps. But every inch of your body is being engaged. And part three of the definition, and ultimately a change in behavior such as fleeing, hiding, or freezing from perceived traumatic events. I mean, those behaviors are self-explanatory. But it seems to me, if we can get our minds to understand what is happening when we feel the metabolic changes in our body and not take the action such as fleeing, hiding, or freezing, we'd be doing okay, right? Mm -hmm. According to Brene Brown, all kinds of things are fear. Rage is fear, drinking is fear, mm. eating can be fear, entomans. Addic entomans, <laughs> your favorite, addiction and violence can be fear. And I think she's talking about and addressing that third point about the changed behavior. Yes. Wanting to drink or eat or pick a fight with someone or play video games for 60 hours yeah. or binge watch TV may be the equivalent. That sounds like a great weekend, though. Right? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good weekend, but it is also the equivalent to fleeing, hiding, or freezing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That certainly feels true to me when I think about like creativity and the avoidance 
of doing the work. Can I side spark for a second? I hope you do. As we are talking, I'm reflecting back on the conversation that we just had mm -hmm. with Anthony and Shockwave from Freestyle Love Supreme, mm -hmm. which may air after this, so get a time machine. But um, I'm struck by how there are artists like them who place themselves again and again and again in this space That's right. of um, just right on the edge of risk and fear, mm -hmm. like willingly over yeah. and over and over again. And we do it in a way too, mm -hmm. but I'm like, they really do it. Like right, they're right. really like walking that razor, razor's edge. Yeah. And I don't want to jump your spark, but there's something that I'm like, it is, it is, I, this is not a this is such a half-baked spark but it's almost like it's saying fuck you to death interesting it's like fuck you I, i'm and li, and and saying fuck you to death yeah. it's like fully living i want you to, to shut to... the fuck up <laughs> <laughs> no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> no i'm going to use a phrase i hate put a pin in that yeah yeah, yeah. um because yeah. we're gonna yeah i want you to say that again but just not a little now. bit later. You got it. And we'll yeah. edit it so it happens all in the right sequence. I'm going to say it so freshly. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, our brain is trying to help. It's designed to protect us, but it doesn't always differentiate between facing a pack of wolves or introducing yourself to a stranger. Yes, you know yes, what I mean? Yes, yes. So we have to learn the difference and retrain our brains to respond differently or for us to respond differently to the way our brain responds. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah, which does. is all about, I'm gonna be like, and so here's Anthony to explain <laughs> that one more time. Um, so you might ask the question, so if we can figure out where the fear comes from, can we avoid experiencing that fear? Yeah. Hmm, maybe, but many times, and this is all in Mira's book, many times the fears that we carry with us are not really our own. We take other people's fears with us. From the moment that adults start giving us advice as yeah. children, we are capturing and storing other people's fears. That's right, I see you. Um, parents can instill fears, but so do aunts and uncles and neighbors and teachers and friends, yeah. and it can be done with the purest yes. of emotions yeah. and intentions. I mean, I know I I see my little baby nieces and my nephew, and I just, just want to like, protect them. Yes, just want to. Like, literally, I was like, please God, if there's anything I can do to keep them from feeling pain or experiencing yeah. heartbreak, I would do it. I would throw myself in front of whatever it was. Yeah. And then I realized, like, those types of cautions and warnings like shape themselves into fears, but then they prevent that person, that child from trying new things. And those might be the things that will shape them into the person they were meant to be. Yeah. So you're actually getting in the way, yeah. frankly. You're yeah. getting in the way. You have to let them experience it. So we also live in a culture that tells us to be afraid. Our media thrives on us being afraid. Spending money is inspired by being afraid. And we're continually being told that changing ourselves or changing our lives is the only way we'll ever be accepted, loved, cherished, or seen. Can you just say a little more about spending money is inspired by being afraid? Sure. Um, thinking that you need new clothing five times yeah. a year because the season has changed. Um, thinking that you need more products for your face or your hair or uh, you just need, need, need. So I that think you it. won't die penniless and alone. That's right, penniless okay. and alone it, if you don't it. buy all this yeah. stuff, yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a really, I have an early example of this fear. I genuinely, I remember like being 12 years old. And when I was that age, like I think my mom let me wear mascara or something, like not much, but um, I would get ready for school, curl my hair, Mascara, lip balm, out the door, and I was like super proud of that because I could wake up and like, boom, I'm done. Then I distinctly remember seeing a headline on Seventeen magazine. Do you remember Seventeen magazine? Do I ever? Okay. Yes. I saw a headline. I sound it, drunk right now. Do I ever? <laughs> I 
I saw this headline, and I'm not joking. It never left me. I'm 40-some years old. I have not what forgotten it? this. It said something like, if your makeup routine takes less than 10 minutes, you probably look tired, and it shows. Oh, fuck off. And I, I'm i like... <laughs> you carry it, that fear in your heart now. I carried it for years. Fuck I was off, like, 17 let magazine. me put this lip balm on a little slower. <laughs> I've been doing this too fast, apparently. But I just felt so like less than because I didn't have a more extensive makeup routine. And therefore, they're, they're partnering with their advertisers to make That's sure right. that you buy the products that you need buy to be stuff. the person who looks refreshed That's and right. dewy and beautiful. That's right. Got it. Yeah. And in the book, Mira talks about her particular fear of being different and my teenage self related so hard. I mean, I remember my fear of being different was like so intense. I was just like, please, God, don't. And also in Kansas, like you, it's like you, you want to be special, but you don't want to stand out. You don't, you want to wear something cute, but you don't want anyone to notice that you put something on cute, you know? So I remember being in science class and we were testing our blood to find out what type we were. And I distinctly recall saying a silent prayer, please God, don't let me be a big negative, please not a B negative, because it would mean that I was different and I was oh. weird because barely anybody has a B negative. And I was not worried about the mental, you know, I mean, the medical issues of like, oh, what if I need blood and there aren't many people who have a B negative. You didn't want to be different. I was mortified. We were all going to have to say what our blood type was. And I was going to have to say, I'm one of the weirdos that has AB negative. And it's running through my veins. <laughs> it is yeah. me. I am it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It was so true. But I'm O positive. <laughs> Thank God. Um, whew. But no, wow. I think I'm... <laughs> wow. I think it's crazy. Because That's amazing. That's amazing. Mira, and Mira wrote this. The fear of being different forces me to be like everyone else. If you don't look too closely, I'm a blur, inseparable from the elements to the left or to the right of me. For a lot of my life, I've tried to remain out of focus. Mm. That broke my heart just a little bit. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really profound and heartbreaking. I'm very thankful that as I aged, I grew out of that and began to recognize the beauty of being different and and I don't really know, like, was that due to great teachers and professors in college or friends in college, some of whom are in the room right now? Um, or has it been a change in our culture? You know, I certainly look at younger generations and there's an emphasis on self-expression that I certainly didn't feel yeah, that's true. growing that's true. up. And I, I embrace that. I envy that. And I hope that sort of continues. Mm. Did you have any particular fears in junior high? I feel like my my my, my history is <laughs> still just feeling it. What uh, like a giant? I've gotten so much better, but I feel like I was so riddled with fears. And we have written. We wrote this musical. Now hear this. And mm -hmm. there's a whole musical number called Members Only about how we believe each of us to a person believed if we had the right article of clothing, a members only jacket. Gloria Vanderbilt jeans, jeans. an Izod polo shirt, that it would grant us access to this members only club mm -hmm. where we were whole and accepted and like, like the, the big man on campus and how, and what a total crock of shit it is. And just to call out somebody else in the audience, I remember after we performed that musical, our friend, uh, Alan came to see it and our friend Mars came to see it. And afterwards, I remember Alan so clearly saying there was this jumper, there was this, this sweater, this <laughs> jumper that I knew that if I could just convince my mom to get me the jumper, yeah. then I would have achieved status. Like yeah. and how we all bought into this belief that yeah. it was, it's the acquisitional mind. If That's I can right. get the jumper, then I will be king. You're a like, better person yeah, and yeah. your life all yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know it's, it's crazy. smoke and mirrors. And yet, Sometimes I still believe we st it. We still feel yeah. it. I mean, because yeah. it's unavoidable. Yeah. 
there are other fears or there's other people that believe that some of these fears are hardwired into us like no matter mm. what we no matter like what we were born like researchers into. and scientists who believe it they're hardwired yeah, into and us? i think writers um my friend susan adams she's a friend mm -hmm. of yours as well she once said to me so succinctly we're all fighting an inner battle our desperate need to be part of the tribe versus the desire to be singled out for being special. Mm -hmm. And we want them both. <laughs> yes. And they both come with their own set of fears. So it's really, really interesting. I heard that, I heard that deeply. Yeah. But some of our fears come from personal experiences, obviously. I know I've witnessed real cruelty from people, from one human being to another, yeah. and I've learned to fear that. I've seen someone left behind and learned to fear the loss of love. Mm. Um, I fear someone being unkind to me or saying bad things about me or my work, mm -hmm. either to my face or behind my back or on social media, which <laughs> just makes it so easy. Yeah. And that is a very, very real fear that has come from personal experience. Yeah. But I've also learned that it won't kill you. Because what you're talking about, I just think it bears mentioning, what you're talking about are these kinds of fears as opposed to literally like, I have an intuition, there's a fear rising up in me that That's right. uh, I'm in danger, like That's right. physical danger right Please now. Please listen to those fears. Yeah. Like the, f the fear is real, but the fear won't kill you. Right. You These can kinds of fears that you're describing. It. But even the fear of, of uh, rock climbing or if the fear it's not the fear that's going to kill you. If fear is telling you that the stranger behind you yeah. is dangerous, yeah. the fear won't kill you. It's trying to tell you the that stranger man will might kill you. Kill you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So got it. Got it. That, it's just a difference of <laughs> terrible. Am I listen to a it? podcast of terrible lessons. That was to be the name of this. Just our <laughs> service to society. Um, I was thinking about the conversation that we had about free solo, um, which is. El Capitan. El Capitan. Yeah. This man climbed it, no, no strings ropes, attached. No rigging. Literally, the, his fingertips. Fingertip by took fingertip. Took him to the top. Um, and we talked a lot about that. And of course, like if you and I decided we wanted to climb El Capitan, or any <laughs> cliff of any size, <laughs> and we felt fear about it, I think that would be a good thing. For us, if we felt fear yeah. and had an inclination to say, maybe this isn't the smartest idea, yeah. we should listen to it. Yes. But for Alex, he trained for years. And fear for him isn't helpful, it isn't necessary, and he has learned to compartmentalize it yeah. so that it literally does not get in the way of, of him doing. doing what he wants yes. to do. I still think about the stakes that are involved in his choices and what a mistake means to him versus what a mistake means to those of us who might be terrified of doing poorly at an audition or terrified of public speaking or getting a bad review. A mistake to him is, is literally death. he might die probably probably will. would die yeah. but a mistake to us is not going to kill us yes there's that distinction that's the distinction yeah. it's not going to kill us it only feels like it will it only feels like we're going to die uh -huh. so when we talk about that in the workshops too about you know the the what's happening physically to us yeah. right yep so we simply have to remember the difference. Despite all this, our society seems a little bit obsessed with this trying to achieve this fearless state, like somehow we could literally become fearless or we celebrate like they're fearless, they're fearless. I think it's really tempting to think that perhaps if you did things differently, maybe you wouldn't have fear or if you'd been a better person, could you could you achieve a fearless state if you'd been better with money or you showed up on time to everything or did everything right maybe you wouldn't feel fear but i think fear will always be here even if we say all the right words even if we do yeah. all the right things send every holiday card on time all that stuff all the zeros in our bank accounts. all that yeah. according to mira Fear will still be here because fear is not a consequence. It's not a punishment we receive for doing something wrong or behaving badly. It's not something we feel because we lack the strength to overcome it. 
fear isn't an obstacle to overcome. Fear is a light that's meant to guide us. This is Mira's writing. Fear is a light that's meant to guide us. It builds strength and provides sustenance. It has the ability to split us open like a knife does a pomegranate, spilling seeds of beauty and incredible possibility from the inside. It's very flowery and very lovely way of putting it and it's nothing like what it feels <laughs> but i thought it was really interesting I'm fear is not spill a, my you're pomegranate like, listen yeah. here's all my, the insides of yeah. me but i thought it was interesting that fear is not a consequence or a punishment yeah that is interesting Do you know what i mean and yeah. again the title of her book according to her fear is a friend and it's here to support you but we understand why it we it feels like a punishment because it's yeah. so uncomfortable that's right it hurts sometimes it aches sometimes that's right yeah it does yeah but it's not gonna kill us uh -huh. <laughs> um uh -huh, sure <laughs> but this idea that fear is a friend is supported by a lot of people if you've ever read stephen pressfield the war of art he writes are you paralyzed with fear that's a good sign fear is good like self-doubt Fear is an indicator. Fear tells us what we have to do. Remember our rule of thumb. The more scared we are of a work or a calling, the more sure we can be that that's what we have to do. Word. The more fear we feel about a specific enterprise, the more certain we can be that that enterprise is important to us and to the growth of our soul. So fear actually shows us what we need to look at. It shows us like how deeply we love something or how much we want something. He also talks in his book about um, professional athletes and their bodies are constantly in pain. Oh yeah. Like literally in pain. Yeah. And there isn't a version of being a professional athlete where you imagine like, well, I'll play when I'm feeling better. I'll, I'll throw, play when nothing I'm gonna hurts. I'm going to throw Broadway dancers in there too. I'm going to, yeah. Right, I'll dance the show when <laughs> nothing hurts. Ha ha. Yeah. You learn to, you dance right through that pain. You dance right yeah. through it. So I think there are examples of people who are experiencing the pain and learning to create and learning to live with it mm -hmm. by their side. Um, so I think we have to do the same as artists. It might be emotional pain, but the pain is there right beside us. We go anyway, we create anyway. Seth Godin says, what we need to do is say, what's the smallest, tiniest thing that I can master? And what's the scariest thing that I can do in front of the smallest number of people that can teach me how to dance with the fear? Once we get good at that, we just realize that it's not fatal. And we intellectually realize we've lived through something that's not fatal. Yeah. And that idea is what's so key, because then we can do it a little bit more yeah. and a little bit more and a little bit more, right? Love it. So before she became a presidential candidate, Marianne Williamson <laughs> yes. wrote a book. So, sorry, I have to interrupt you. I was walking down the street the other day and I didn't yeah. realize, I didn't realize that she was still uh, in the running. In the running. I think as of today, she may not be, but I think she just let her staff go. Yeah. But this was last Aww. week. And I saw somebody had taped up just with scotch tape a Marion Williamson for president poster. And I was like, well, she's out of the race. Don't mind if I do. Because I was like, what an amazing poster. It. it has this watcolor painting of Marion. I was like, this is the most misty watercolor presidential campaign poster I've ever seen. <laughs> And I need that. And you know, I enjoy, I enjoy, I have one whole room in my house that is just kitsch. And I was like, <laughs> baby's getting framed. I need that. <laughs> I need that. Yeah. Sorry. You were saying, um, but she did write a book called A Return to Love. Yeah. Um, which is based on the principles of A Course in Miracles. And within it, this little gem of a poem, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. 
We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Yes. Yeah, I love it. I do love it, yeah. So I know that once I thought of letting my light shine as a selfless gesture rather than a selfish gesture, which I had been taught previously. Something that could be of service to others. That is correct. That you can start to think about like, oh, I have an answer for that fear inside that asks, hey, what what makes you worthy? Why should you get what you want when other people don't get what they want? In going after it, you're actually freeing others to go after it too. Like Toni Morrison said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were going to say it. Oh, uh, I feel like I say it 17 times a day. That's okay. I don't know if we've said it on the podcast. Have we? As Toni Morrison uh, said, and I repeat constantly, the function of freedom is to free others. There you go. It's that. It's It's once you've figured out a little something, can you hold up the lantern to light the way for other people to maybe make the path a little more illuminated and their lives just a touch easier? That's right. Yeah. Fear. What do we make of it? It, What we can make of it is limitless, genuinely. On a personal level, you can trace your fears back to their source and find many sparks of inspiration there. You can face your fears directly and write about what happened when you've looked right at them. I love it. A lot of people do this. This is like, I don't know if Elizabeth Gilbert was the first, but it seems like she sort of kicked off that genre with Eat, Pray, Love. Yeah. Of like, I'm going to spend time with myself, which terrifies me. I'm going to look at the choices I've made and I'm going to travel and write about it. Yeah. And then like a lot of people Step do away that. from an established life. And, yeah. yeah. Um, or you can do something like artist Candy Chang, who creates public artworks that embrace doubt and nervous thoughts and literally puts them on display. She's the creator of the Before I Die series, which is this like traveling enormous chalkboard that allows people to share their deepest wishes and desires before they die. <laughs> um, so they write on the wall I'm and by that. shining a light on them and bringing them into the open, that you know, the power they have over us can be diminished. I love it. So that's something. Um, you can go right to the center of your fears and create work that will scare others, like horror films. Mm. Or turn the horror film genre on its side and create a comedic cultural horror film like Get Out. Yeah. Jordan Peele, the writer, director of Get Out, said, it was very important to me to just get the entire audience in touch in some way with the fears inherent in being black in this country. Part of being black in this country, and I presume being any minority, is constantly being told that we're seeing racism where there just isn't racism. He also said, this movie is my truest passion. It comes from this fact that in order to deal with my own fears, I wanted to be able to master them. I love that. I love what he created out of that. I love it because he talked further about how um, the challenge was... so. Any person of a minority might come in and understand that fear immediately. But if he wanted a Caucasian audience to understand that fear, he had to write it and navigate it in such a careful way. And he did, like, he so succeeded where, like, no one can name another movie that's ever done that. So I think he, I'd say he conquered his fear he and helped yeah. yeah, and helped us all take a look in the mirror. I, I'm amazed by that. Those are just a few things mm. that you can create with really your good. fear. We all feel the fear. Can we learn to love it or like it or at least listen to it? Can we support each other when we're feeling it? It's going to be there. I think that is a fact. So if we're going to do this together... I say let's do it and let's invite our friend Fear. Oh, Cammy. Oh, Black Wow. <laughs> What's that? It's so, such a good spark. Oh, and I feel thanks. like a, a couture spark for the participants in the creativity <laughs> couture. workshop. We're all wearing couture now. I couture feel very sparks. Fancy. That is sparks on sparks on sparks thanks. on sparks. And I feel like. Uh, I have, we were talking in the workshop 
about giving ourselves permission and just acknowledging that many artists, we tell the same story over and over and over again. And we might dress it up in a different costume and sometimes it might be a comedy and sometimes it might be a horror movie and sometimes it might have a tap number in the middle of it. But we sometimes, like there are artists like myself, we tell That's the same right. story over and over and over again. And one of my greatest hits is a travel log of my fears. It is. Over and over and over again. We talked about that if we can sidebar for a second, yeah. it's your Die Vampire Die song yeah. where you talk about first the fears are little gnats. They're also your, your yeah. spray them up, you know, cleanse it My up. My aunt. Your aunt. Right. And then the Dementor. Yeah. And I feel, we talked about this after, I feel like fear is a funny thing. If you saw all of those as fears and you were like, ha. That is hilarious. So you've gone from your little, you didn't get me to stop when you were little gnats. And yeah. you didn't get me to stop when you asked me to freshen it up. So you have brought out the big guns now. Yeah. So now we're dementors. Now you're, like if you could see the ridiculousness of the, the shape-shifting, shape-shifting yeah. that fear oh, they're takes. Slippery. They're slippery it's and they're whack-a-mole. clever. It's whack a yes. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we've had fun discussions about fear. What's, I feel what's like, more fun than that? Yeah, you're right. There is, unless you're a, a sociopath, there is sort of a, a bottomless pit of sparks in relationship to this fear. And That's if right. I do Die Vampire Die, it's going to be different than what Austin makes out of whatever his, his principal vampires fear is. are. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it, Camion. Thanks, Blackwell. What a beautiful spark that was. Thank you. I God can't wait to hear thesis. yours. Ooh, <laughs> will it measure up? All right, let's now do I'm this. Now I'm going to kick back. Let's do this. Kick back. Here we go. The, spark the title of my spark today is Find the Need and Endeavor to Meet It. I was struck when we were sharing yesterday in the workshop, somebody's spark, one of their principal sparks that they first showed out was necessity. And mm. I was like, ooh, have I got a spark for you? Find the need and endeavor to meet it. The sources include, sometimes I have 52 sources. My source today is an interview with my spark subject, period. What? Let's dive in. Um, so as of this recording, we just completed the Spark File Creativity Challenge, which is, it's just a total deep dive into creativity. The challenge, in a nutshell, asks anyone who wants to participate to do something creative every day from December 1st to January 1st, and we post a little video each morning, including a prompt, and if you're someone who responds well to prompts, then that works out great, but you don't have to do the prompt. And then uh, people share all day what they have created, and then we do a little wrap-up every night to share out some of the things that um, people are making. Um, and in addition to running this challenge, Cams, you do something creative every day. I do something creative every day. You, Cams, you wrote a lot. You wrote so many pages. Thanks, but you did something like different every day. I know, day, I did a lot of different amazing. things. I painted, I decorated, I crafted, I planted things. I edited a lot of video and sound files for the Spark file. Um, I wrote stuff, we podcasted, uh, we continued to grow yeah. and refine our curriculum. Just so, so many different things. And it was awesome. And also, let's be real, it was, sometimes it was so tiring. Mm. It was so tiring, but when all is said and done, it was so worth it because it, it we had this external accountability from this community of people mm -hmm. on the internet, some of whom we had never met, many of whom we've never met before. And just with that, we were creating so many things so that wouldn't have existed. They wouldn't have been there if we hadn't done the challenge. So. Sidespark, you know that for many years I've been trying to come up with a word that describes the sensation that I feel when I'm in creative flow. Mm -hmm. Because creative flow, that phrase just sounded so to It doesn't me. do it for you. It doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a complicated feeling to capture because it's got a lot of dimensions. And when you're there, it's right at the center of all of these things. It's, to me, it feels flowing, but it also feels focused and it's peaceful and it's satisfying and it's meditative in a way, but it also is like very active and it can feel transcendent, like time takes on a different dimension. Mm -hmm. And when I'm experiencing it, there's usually this moment where I experience this sort of like thrill and my lungs get this like puff of exhilaration and I'm like, huh, huh, huh. 
It's happening. It's happening right now. Um, so I was, I'm always, I have been banging my head against a wall. What is the word that sums it all up? I've been working on it, and here's where I'm at. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. It's a big fucking build up. Okay. Let's all lower our expectations. Okay. 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 Um, okay. This is where I'm at creative, meditative, flow state, woe state, satisfaction. And you can sing it or say it to the tune of super califragilistic XB allodocious. <laughs> but I think it gets all the things I'm feeling. Will you sing it to that tune? Creative, meditative, flow state, woe state, satisfaction. That is the closest I've come. I love to putting, it. Settle love down, it. everybody. It's I the closest it. I've come to putting <laughs> language to that feeling. And I'm going to keep you updated on any changes that I make to that word. Please don't Side spark concluded. Just wanted you to know. In any event, um, so we just finished rocking this month long creativity challenge. One of the things I created was that word. Um, and I was talking with Laura about the challenge and all of the work, the workshop and all of it. And I was thinking, all of this stuff matters so much to me, like enough that I would take time at my desk to try to refine that word mm -hmm. like it's my job. Mm -hmm. But why? Why am I so passionate about it? Where is this coming from, all of this energy and excitement around creativity specifically? Why am I endlessly obsessed with the pursuit of creativity and talking about creativity and teaching about creativity and urging people to create more and sort of evangelizing about mm -hmm. how life can be better, like life is yeah. tough, and if you've got to experience it, at least you can make something out of it, and trying to come up with these words to describe this transcendent bliss that I feel when I create. Why? Why, why, why? 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 What's your why? I think so much of it goes back to one single human being. That person is my spark for today. It is my mother, <gasps> Nancy Ann Blackwell. It's Nancy? It's Nancy. Oh, my gosh. She is one of the most, everybody's like, I'm hooray. so excited that it's uh, Nancy. <laughs> I'm so excited. Oh, my gosh. It was a real something that happened over here. <laughs> it was either like it's hooray Nancy. or deflation. I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's see, let's see how hooray. it unpacks. It was hooray. So, Cams, you and I have talked on this podcast about what Rich Sparks, our family, and our family history can provide. That is correct. And we've even talked about interviewing our family to mine Sparks. And I've done yeah. that in the past. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go back. I'm going to dig deeper and bless that I have the luxury to do that. Mm -hmm. Both of my parents are alive, and That's I know right. that is a privilege. I'm going to ask some questions I hadn't asked before. So, I, which was oh. felt risky. I'm not kidding. I was a little nervous about it. So, but I did ask my mother's permission to interview her. We spoke for about two and a half hours, all told. And I asked her questions that we would ask our guests during a maker no so. Way. Yeah. No and way. No way. I'm going to tell you, I was shakata by some of her answers. But I'd just like to share some of the things oh, that I learned with you share. all. Please share. Please share. Here we go. Can I just say, Nancy is such a delight. Yeah. And one, I got to spend a weekend like preparing for a Christmas party and all of you cooking in the kitchen. It's like, oh, it, it's so clear yeah. how special. you got where you yeah. where all that came from. Yeah, yeah. she's really special. As and, are you. And th thanks, Kim. Um, and uh, so let's learn a little bit more yes. about my mother, Nancy <laughs> Ann Blackwell. Yes. <laughs> Michael Liddick's eyes were just like, what? what? Um, here we go. We'll see how this goes. This spark feels like a risk, but here we go. So my mom was born in 1941 in Dayton, Ohio. I'm bad at math, but I think that puts her just about around 80 years old. Sure. Geniuses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, she is the second of three children. So she's the middle child. Her father, Ed, was a farmer and a florist. And her mother, Mary, did all the things to raise three kids and run a house and keep the plants growing on the farm and keep the business running. And my mom described her childhood and her life with her family as haphazard. And I think she's maybe being a little uh, poetic and generous with that word. Hmm. Um, my, her parents, my grandparents, grew up during the Depression. And my mom always thought that they were poor because they had so very little. And that may have been true to some measure. But more than that, her parents were very frugal, especially her father. Her father did most of the shopping. And they didn't have a lot. 
the nuns at her Catholic school used to try to enlist students to join the convent, and these nuns practically had my mother signed up to go be a nun. Really? And she, yep, they sent a list home with her, and she remembers seeing the list of things required if you went to the convent and thinking, oh my God, my parents will never buy me all of this stuff for the convent. Oh. To underwear, like 10 pairs of underwear, they'll never buy if me. If she wanted to be a nun, underwear. they would be like, we're not buying that. No, 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 no. Um, she was like, my parents are never going to buy me this. So wow. that's just an indication of... They just, I just, think that I, this is so inappropriate, but like I think about my underwear drawer and I've got to tell you, it's a fine underwear drawer filled with many I beautiful pieces it. of underwear. I believe it. And I'm like, it. my mom was just like, they're never going to buy me underwear. Um, so, but can you specify, I just want a little bit of clarity. Mm -hmm. She thought they, they weren't, weren't buying those things because they didn't, Have they couldn't money. afford it. Yeah. But did she discover later? They had Am I money. jumping your shark? No. Your, Spark. Did you say, are, am I jumping your shark? Yep. <laughs> awesome. All of it stays maybe, in. All maybe I in. did. They had That's some money. They weren't spending the money. Wow. But in fairness, you know, my mom said, and I believe this is true, like they, every, all the parents are doing the best that they can. That's right. Sometimes the best is not the greatest, but yeah. they're all doing the best yeah. they can. Okay. So my mom, her parents and her older sister and younger brother lived a pretty rural life. They never had running water. They had a cistern under their porch, so they didn't really take baths. My mom would say, I was like, then mm -hmm. what were you doing? Because we live in this modern mm -hmm. world where, you know, shower every day. You get the privilege yeah. of, you know, mm -hmm. hot running water. And my mom said they would just wash up. They would just wash up like with wow. a washcloth and a little water. So with like a damp washcloth. But and this is the 40s. I'm bad at yeah. 40s into the 50s. Okay. And their clothes were washed in a ringer washer, but that was hard to do in the winter. So she doesn't really know how often that happened or really how clean they kept. Okay. I'm just uh, wow. stating facts. Yeah. So they also worked a fair amount to support the family floral business. My grandparents had a greenhouse and on a holiday where people would purchase flowers to place on the grave of a loved one, like on Mother's Day or Memorial Day, my grandfather would drop my mom off at the entrance to the cemetery with a bunch of flowers, and she would just be there all day by herself, selling <sighs> flowers to people who came, like a oh. little girl, until he came back in the evening to pick her up, sometimes after dark. And people would stop their cars mm -hmm. and ask if she was okay. And she would just say, I'm just waiting for my dad. Oh. And it all sounded so scary and so boring. Yeah. Both. So yeah. when they weren't working, they did. They had to do a lot of picking, like mm -hmm. from the farming. They had to do like a lot of picking, which my mother said she totally hated. There was not a lot to do at their remote rural house. And this wasn't a time or a family who invested a lot in keeping kids engaged, which I all the time thought was so sparkish and interesting because now it's just like, here's an iPad, here's a thing, mm -hmm. here's another thing. We're going to, like, here's enrichment. Like, there's so yeah. much. And yeah. my grandparents were not giving a fuck about that. So there wasn't a lot to do in the downtime. Um, there was a radio. And my mother had some books, and my, she would spend the afternoons in the greenhouse reading. The bookmobile would come to school, and she was allowed to take out X number of books, and she would find out when the bookmobile was scheduled to return, and she would calculate the total number of pages of all her checked out books. She would divide the pages by the number of days, and she would ration how many pages she would oh. allow herself to read each day until she could get fresh books. But she, my uh. mother loves to read, so of course she would always like read ahead. She loves, loves, uh. loves, loves reading, and still, still does because it was such a source of entertainment and, all she and escape. she wanted was access to books. All she wanted was bo books, Ugh. books, books, books. Um, but it was a real source of escape yeah. and entertainment and learning for of her. Course. Yeah. So um, I asked my mom a question that we frequently ask our guest, which is, when you reflect on your mm. personal life thus far, is there a line of demarcation, an event or a chapter that defines your life before this event mm -hmm. and after? And my mom said, of course, there are the big life-changing events like marriage and children and completing her education and all of that. 
But for her, it would probably be when she learned to sew. Oh, not yes. my birth. When she learned to sew. <laughs> so for her 16th birthday, my mom asked for it and actually, and I cannot believe this, received a Sears sewing machine. And she went down to Sears and she learned how to use it. Mm. So as I said, reading was a source of freedom and escape for my mom. And sewing became a source of freedom and escape for her too. As long as she could get fabric, she could dress herself and she didn't have to rely on my old farmer grandfather to purchase clothing to for her underwear and she could also be of service which we'll get to in a second so backing up my mother attended um i've talked about this a little bit on the pot i think i've expressly actually told this story before but enjoy it again my mother attended an all-girls catholic school and she graduated first in her class all that reading. Wow. And as valedictorian, my mom was offered a full ride scholarship to the University of Dayton. And the headline that we still have, it's yellowed and falling apart. The headline in the Dayton paper read, high school senior turns down juicy UD scholarship to go to nursing school. Right when she graduated uh. from high school, she went to nursing school. And the fashion changed and hemlines went up four inches right at that time. I think it was Jackie O time and hemlines went boop. And she set up her sewing machine on her dorm room desk and she raised everybody's hem four inches on all their skirts wow. and all their coats. She also, I've said this on the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. I've said this on the podcast before, but she never considered taking the scholarship. She said she didn't have a lot of social skills given her background, that makes sense. And the idea of going to university really scared her. Her parents didn't really prize education. None of her teachers ever offered her any guidance and not a single person challenged her and said, you can do this. Or maybe they figured out that she, yeah, she was set in her plans mm. to go to get married and go to nursing school. So that's what she aimed for. And then she got pregnant and then she got pregnant again. And then she did that several more times. And she was finally able to go back to nursing school when I, the youngest of her children, was old enough to start school, too. Wow. Yeah. So we've talked about this before, but the difference between concerted cultivation and natural growth. My, both of my parents are really children of natural growth, and there weren't a lot of adults around, let's say zero adults around, who were... Um, just challenging the notion that this really, oh, this is such a spark for me, this, this really intelligent young person. That's right. What a brain. That's right. What a brain that this intelligent young person could do more, be more. That's right. They weren't advocating no. for her. And, and side spark, just based on conversations with my mom throughout the years, I think if that mentorship had existed, she would have become a doctor. That wow. is my guess. Yeah. Wow. Um, in addition to sewing, my mom possesses several other creative skill sets, crocheting, gardening, baking, cooking, costuming. And these different forms of creativity are often dictated by the season. In the spring, summer, and fall, gardening, and she really is an expert gardener because of all those mm -hmm. years on the farm, gardening uses so much of her day and time and energy and other things get pushed to the background. And then when the weather turns colder and the holidays are approaching, my mom is making gifts and cookies and cookie gifts. And usually she has several projects going. And she said that these projects, these acts of creativity, give her a reason to get out of bed in the morning, which I deeply related to. Why would I run such a labor-intensive creativity challenge? These are the things that give me a reason to get yeah. up and out of bed in the morning. And something else that I observe is that creativity and love are so intertwined for me. Mm. Some of my closest friends are the people that I've made things with. I feel like this creativity, it brings color to our lives and yeah. it provides us a reason for living That's right. and a reason for engaging with each other. Mm -hmm. My mom said she's never met a pattern or a recipe that she couldn't do. Oh, Smell oh, you, I Nancy Blackwell. That. I um, believe that. She said she does it once by the book. And oh, then it's after then that, she's got it's it. cross country. And I was like, yay, I loved it. I loved it. Um, 
Like many of us, my mom said, every time she starts a project, she wonders if she will see it to completion. She has started and not finished many things throughout her lifetime. Even the highly competent, amazing maker, Nancy Blackwell, there are many things she has not finished in her lifetime. And now in her 80s, she looks at stuff and says, is this a realistic project? She Uh. likes to strike this balance of staying in her comfort zone, executing things that provide some new learning and challenge, but not so much challenge that they're super stressful. Mm -hmm. She says she enjoys challenges, especially when they're done, which again, I was like, (laughs) I am your child, Nancy Blackwell. (laughs) Now that I've done it, that was great. Um, My mom has made a lot of clothes and costumes for me in my Mm. lifetime. And now um, her grandniece, Kaylee, keeps my mom very busy making her anime cosplay costumes and Renaissance costumes. And my mom said most of the characters, my mom hasn't, my mom wouldn't know a Sailor Moon from a, <laughs> she's never heard of them. And she, but it doesn't stop her. It doesn't stop her nope. from just like digging in. And because she is her father's daughter, she can also stretch a sewing dollar. Oh, she said that fabric has gotten over the years, it's gotten very expensive. And when she's costuming, for instance, a high school production of Les Miserables, <laughs> she buys, she goes to the thrift store and she buys a lot of old sheets and towels and tablecloths and blankets and fabric. And those textiles can make wonderful costumes. She said she had a bolt of rotting denim that should have been thrown away, but she ended up like sort of hacking off the rotted parts, washing washing it because she is sanitary. She was a nurse after all. Um, But she made a billion tattered shop aprons for the working poor characters in this high school production of Les Miserables. Oh my God. Nancy Blackwell, she'll stretch a motherfucking dollar. Um, She said, and I want to stitch this into a pillow, a good costume lives forever because you can repurpose it, you can reaccessorize it, you can let it out, you can mm. take it in, and it can just live on and on forever. And sometimes when she does a production of a high school musical at the high school where I went, <laughs> which I, it's very rural, and I had a graduating class of 87 people, and half of those people went to vocational school, very small. But when she's doing a costume there, she'll be fitting a cast member, and she'll say, this costume is older than you are, kid because she is my mother. Um, For a recent high school production of Fiddler on the Roof, for all the men, they all had to have a vest, and they couldn't be store-bought suit vests. They had to be like working men's pogrom vests. So she went to the thrift store. She bought up all the sort of like earth-toned sweatshirts. She turned them inside out. She cut off the sleeves. She cut uh, up the, through the center. She would sew a pleat on the front. So, so all the high school teachers are like, yes. <laughs> she would sew some, high, some buttons on it and make them all these little like fiddler on the roof vests. And then with all the leftover sweatshirt sleeves, she made them into cat hammocks for my cousin's rescue cats. <laughs> So in the cat cage, there are these sleeping hammocks for the cats that they can crawl up into. And she made cat slings. Useful. She's not, Very useful. Nancy Black was not fucking around. She's not. I'm, yeah. She's amazing. So I asked my mom of all the things she's created so far, what she was the most proud of, mm-hmm. which is something we often ask makers. And she said she made her own wedding dress, which was simple, but she was proud of it. But the single most challenging thing was my sister Julie's wedding dress. My mom said it took them forever to figure out the pattern and the bodice and then to make each layer and then they took the lace overlay, they divided it amongst a couple of women in the family, and they hand beaded it. Then they brought it back together, they assembled it, and it was a major engineering project to try to figure out the logistics of this very long train that trailed behind my sister as she came down the aisle. And then it all came up together, and with a series of buttons, it bustled for the reception. Oh my gosh. And I got to tell you, that fucking dress, so I'm sorry, mother, so much profanity. That effing dress is, it is <laughs> much like, better, it is an archi- it was an architectural feat. Just That's incredible. Stunning, stunning. Then in the years that followed, out of the wedding dress scraps, my mom made christening gowns for each of my sister Julie's children to be baptized wow. in. 
And each little, my, my uh, sister's uh, veil had this sort of headband, and each little sculpted rose on my sister's veil was handmade by my mother, too. And it's an idea. She was sparked when she was visiting New York, and she visited the garment district. I think I can count on uh, one Maybe, maybe on my fingers, the times my parents have gotten on a plane to travel, but they were visiting uh, New York City, and she took a men- they wouldn't allow her to take a photo, so she took a mental snapshot, and she went home and she made it herself, the wow. headpiece and the veil. Wow. She said she's inclined to look at something and think, "I could do that." Mm. Let's go home and make that, mm-hmm. which I think if you're a maker is an interesting way to live. If you see a movie you love or a TV show or a painting or a dance piece, whatever the spark is, as long as it's not a perfect replica, all the better. In the words of Stevie Sondheim, anything you do, let it come from you, then it will be new. And I really do think that is true to add the fourth rhyme (laughs) Um, people will say to my mom I should learn how to sew and my mom's response is you have to want it you have to be motivated Mm. it's like learning a language or an instrument and here's my mom's creative advice for all of us do what you like doing as much as possible which I thought was deceptively simple but useful advice do what you really like doing Mm -hmm. not what you think you should be doing Mm -hmm. maybe not even what you trained what your degree is Mm -hmm. you know is in to do do what you like doing now as much as possible after I went into elementary school my mom went back to Sinclair Community College in Dayton Ohio and she finished her nursing degree I get very proud when I think about my parents finishing their their education. At her graduation, she received her nursing pin that had a quote inscribed by the founder of the school, a man named David Sinclair. It said, find the need and then endeavor to meet it. My mom thought that was a damn fine guiding principle, whether it applied to someone who needed their hem shortened four inches or an affordable nursing uniform or a Renaissance costume or a wedding dress. And she said she tries not to say no to anyone because there are so few people that have the time and the ability to do what she can do, especially for people who have trouble finding or affording clothes that fit. Oh, man. Amy Poehler wrote about her longtime collaborator, Tina Fey. Tina shows her love for you by writing for you. And I asked my, I shared that quote with my mom, and I asked if she thought that one of the ways she shows love for people is by creating for them. And I was certain I knew the answer. And she said, sure. And then it's also my deep insecurity that I'm desperately needy of being loved. And I was floored by that. Didn't expect that one. I did not. Wow. I had always thought it was purely her way of expressing love, which is a part of it, but on a deeper level, so much of it was her asking to be loved. Be loved. When I asked her the question we ask of all of our makers, what's it all for? She said again, just in case I missed it, so someone will love me. So I want to say a few words about my mother for my mother. Mm. Nancy Blackwell was born in 1941 in Dayton, Ohio, and she still lives there, y'all. Her parents, my grandparents, grew and sold flowers, and they lived way, way out there with no indoor plumbing and not a lot to do. My grandfather did the shopping for the family, and he was tight with a dollar. My mother didn't have much in the way of clothing. When my mother was in eighth grade, her teacher notified the parents that every student had to have an angel costume for the school pageant, and my grandmother refused. She thought it was a ridiculous request, and she wouldn't be obliged, and no other adult stepped in to help. So my mom found an old gown. It had been a hand-me-down from a wealthy woman my grandmother had worked for as a maid, and my mother used the fabric to make her own angel costume. When my mother was 16, she asked for a sewing machine for her birthday. She started using the machine to make her own clothes on that machine, self-taught. So when I was little, little, I shared a bedroom with my brother and with my mother's sewing machine. And when I was in kindergarten, my report card was pretty good. This is what it actually said. Susan is a delight to have in class. When she is here, 
she is absent 50% of the time. We would love to see Susan in school more often. You know what I had to say at five years old? F that S. I wanted to be at home playing at my mother's feet while she sewed at her sewing machine and chatted with me. What Mm. could be better than that? Mm. I've heard stories about other people's mothers who say things like, you're not planning on leaving the house like that, are you? When teenage me would come home to my mother with a sketch on a piece of loose leaf paper and say, I have an idea for a dress. It's sort of goth. It's got a bat wing sleeve. It's got a wasp waist. It's got a dirndl skirt. It's like tea length. It's got a cow hood, and I'm picturing it with like granny boots and a snood. (laughs) True, true story. My mother has never said the words, no kid of mine is going out looking like that. My mother immediately digs into how it can be constructed, what fabric might work best to get that bat wing sleeve to drape just so, where we can source snoods in the greater Dayton area. No judgment, just creativity. At my grandmother's funeral, Mom told me that the first time she told her mother that she loved her was when my grandmother was lying unconscious in her hospital bed. They just did not say it to each other. Contrast that with the millions of times my parents have told me that they love me. And I was so curious, how did she learn to do that when she didn't learn it from her parents? She says, I don't know, we just did it. Self-taught. Self-taught. When I think of my mother, I picture her at her sewing machine. She has spent the better portion of her life making sure that anyone who asks has what they need. Christening dresses, First Holy Communion dresses, prom dresses, wedding gowns, nursing uniforms, costumes for the local high school musical, Halloween costumes. Speaking of, when me and my siblings were little, my mom bought cheap remnants of this brown fake fur. It looked like Rolf from the Muppets. And the fabric had this very suspicious smell, which is probably why it was on the dollar a yard table. And she made these hooded footy pajama suits in various sizes. And every Halloween, she would take the suit that fit you the best that year, and she would just swap out the ears of this generic fur suit. So one year, you'd be like a weird smelling cat. And then you'd be like a weird smelling rabbit. And then you'd be like a weird smelling puppy. Nancy Blackwell. <laughs> thrifty I as need hell. Pictures yeah. is what I need. Yeah. I need pictures. It's very thrifty, but oh. also very generous. If you compliment me on a blouse that my mother has made, she will make one for you, but she will never take any money for her sewing. My mother has spent her life making sure we all have our angel costume over and over and over again. But my mother is not an angel. She is a human lady. And like all of us, she is perfectly imperfect. Still in all, how grateful am I that I pulled that Nancy Blackwell card? Mm. How lucky that she is mine. And how fortunate am I that I get to say a few words about my mother. And those words are creative, generous, intelligent, warm, Loving, loved, love. Nancy Blackwell, y'all. Blackwell. And that is my spark du jour. That's a good spark. I can't wait for Nancy to hear that spark. I really can't. Nancy Blackwell, she's just the best. She's just well, the best. And she has created more than just beautiful clothing. Oh. Sorry to be cheesy. Are you talking about me? I am. <laughs> I am. They did a good, they did a good they job. Did a, they did a really, good job. Really and again, good job. the thing I'm so fascinated by with both of my parents, and I talked about my dad on the Golden Palace episode yeah. and in the, the piece, Golden Palace, is how did these people coming from, I mean... Imagine if you, I can't even imagine. But isn't it a pendulum swing? Like she wasn't given those things and she has made a life of giving Giving. those things. Yes, and I think there are many people who 
didn't have those things and could have or do become embittered. Sure. They become a lot of things that aren't, you know, great for raising mm -hmm. kids and other things. And I just think what alchemy occurred. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we make of it? Well, I make that piece. <sighs> I make that spark for my yeah. mom. But also I feel like we make and make and make we make as an act of love. We take the th hard things that we've been through because life mm -hmm. is sometimes awesome and sometimes not awesome. And if you're gonna, if you have to live through it, why not make, make something out of it? Make. How lucky we are to be makers, so that we can, mm. whatever our angel costume is, make something out of it. Amen to that. Listen, that's a beautiful spark, Blackwell. Oh, Camion. I feel like I really put everybody through the ringer washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> But we went together, and that's what matters. I just want to say before we wrap this baby up that uh, we have had an extraordinary time with the participants in the Spark File New Year 2020 Creativity Workshop and we live have. podcast. Like what? We have. A, like just truly that collective of people. What? a basket full of miracles there. Looking are. at their faces right I know, now. Their beautiful faces. So I just want to thank them for being sparks to us as yeah. well. But thank that's it. Guys. We hope that all of this, whatever this was, put another bunch of sparks in your spark, spark file. Listen, if there's a spark you'd like us to explore, or if you've taken a spark and fanned it into a creative flame, and you'd like to share that, won't you email us at thesparkfile at gmail.com or submit it through our website, thesparkfile.com. We'll even take your feedback, but you know the price of admission. First, you got to share a creative risk that you have taken recently. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe, rate, five-star, review it. If you like this podcast, what's that voice? If you like <laughs> this podcast, <laughs> share it with people that you love. And if you didn't like it, in the words of Scandal's 1982 hit song, Goodbye to you. Goodbye to you. Nice. Threw the mic out on that one. That's nice. <laughs> Woo! If something tickles your fancy and gets your creative juices flowing, we are writing you a forever permission slip to make that thing that has been knocking at your door. It's your turn to take a spark and fan it into a flame. You got to pick a low it. You got to talk show it. You got to take some love and give some love. And Nancy Blackwell sew it. <laughs> you you got to take, take it. it. And pay. Something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my spark fire. I jump into my spark fire. Let's open up the spark fire. We want to extend special thanks to Ryan Field and Garrett for providing the original music to the piece about my mom entitled Sewing Machine. We also want to thank our live hype man, Jack D'Amelio, everyone at Mark Fisher Fitness, Mark Fisher, Michael Keeler, Andrew Cole, the amazing Denise Dumper, and special thanks to the attendees of the Spark File New Year 2020 Creativity Workshop and Live Podcast. You are all truly a shower of sparks. Hi friends, Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify in advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. Illum.